Shoo, Mr. Dursley said loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behavior? Mr. Dursley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had a nice day. Had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learnt a new word, shut. Mr. Dursley tried to act normal. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room and in, in time to catch the last report on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in the daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleep patterns. The news the newsreader allowed himself to grin. Most mysterious. And now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, said the weatherman, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that you that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of rain, I promised yesterday, there have been a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks. But I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair. Shooting stars all over Britain? Owls flying by daylight? Mysterious people in cloaks all over the place? And a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He had to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. <clears throat> uh, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard anything from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, Miss Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? The funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls, shooting stars, and there were a lot of funny-looking people in town today. So? Mrs. snapped Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought maybe it was something to do with, you know, her lot. Mrs. Dursley sipped her, sipped her tea through her pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he'd dare tell her he heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said as casually as he could, their son, he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said Miss Dudley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry. Nasty common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dur Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Privet Drive as though it was waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could this all have anything to do with the Potters? If it did, if it got out that he were related to a pair of... Well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly. But Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that, even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. 
how very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no signs of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't so much as quiver when the car door slammed in the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching. Appeared so suddenly and silently, you'd have thought he just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen in Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak, which swept the ground, and high-heeled, buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkled beyond half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something, but he didn't seem to realize he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He had found what he was looking for, for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it up in the air, and clicked it. The nearest street light went out with a little pop. He clicked it again. The next light flickered in the darkness. Twelve times, ugh, twelve times, he clicked the put outer. Until the only light left in the whole street were two tiny pinpricks of the dis in the distance which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out the window now, even beardy, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put-outer back inside his cloak and set off down the street towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment, he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe-looking woman who was wearing square glasses exactly the shape of the markings the cat had around its eyes. She too was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked dis she looked distantly she looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? she asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd be if you'd been sitting on that brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? When you could have been celebrating? I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here, Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh yes, everybody's celebrating all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful. But no. Even the muggles have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Durs back at the Dursley's dark living room. Living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls. Shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I'll bet that was Delata's Diggle. He never, he never did have much scent, sense. You can't blame them," said Dumbledore gently. "We've been, pre we've had precious little to celebrate for eleven years." I know that," said Professor McGonagall irritably. "But that's no reason to lose our heads. 
People are being downright careless out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors 